Woods. Hello, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our Tuesday evening, our Tech Tuesday evening. And we started a new series last week on inflammation. And just a, a little brief recap. Inflammation is what happens when your body responds to an injury or a stressor or a disease. And if it's an injury, usually it's short-term inflammation. And once the injury is settled and stabilized, um, the inflammation goes away. The problem, just like stress, is something that is now becoming a lot more common because inflammation is coming as a result, or chronic inflammation is coming along as a result of our diets and our lifestyles because it is coupled with things like chronic stress. So we are all ending up with these so-called lifestyle diseases, which are almost exactly a direct result of chronic, meaning long-term inflammation in our system that our body just cannot cope with. We are designed to have stress. We are designed to have inflammation. We are not designed for it to be part of our life 24 seven. And that sadly is what is happening in today's day and age. So let me share my screen and kick in from where we were last week. Um, I do this to myself every time. And that I don't get the correct thing over there. Let me shrink me down. Get me out of the way. All right. So chronic inflammation. I've referenced this talk mostly from the Cleveland Clinic newsletter. And um, so a lot of the information, uh, information comes from there, but I've also taken it from a couple of other places as well. And chronic inflammation is our body's version of rust, like a car. So we, we went through a few of the basics last week, and you can go back and check out last week's recording because I don't have time to get into all of that. And now we're starting off with, uh, there we go. The fact that fat is good. We see so much these days that fat is bad and it's low fat this and low fat that and cut down on your fats. But fat is good. It's not all bad because it depends on what kind of fat. Now, the omega-3 um, fatty acids or fish oils with EPA DHA and the plant sources of ALA. Now remember that some of the um, omega-3 supplements do have all eight of the omegas. Um, where's my thing? So your good fats are your omega-3 fatty acids. Your monounsaturated fats like canola and olive oils. Your decreased, or there has been decreased fat consumption since the 1960s associated with obesity epidemic. Um, the CHO intake has increased dramatically. So in other words, the bad fats have increased dramatically and the good fats have decreased. The glycemic index, um, uh, sorry, the glycemic index and glycemic load is also affected by uh, this CHO um, because that's what's, what's triggering it in the long term. So you get different types of fats. The saturated fat, you'll find in things like beef and other animal fats, and also in dairy. The mono and uh, the, the mono unsaturated fats are the omega-9. Olive and canola oils are all parts of these saturated fats. The polyunsaturated fats, or the essential fatty acids, this is the omega-6 linoleic acid, which you find in vegetable oils, seeds, and nuts. 
We see a lot of that in today's foods. The gamma linolenic acid or GLA, you'll find in things like borage and primrose oil. And the arachidonic acid or AA, you find in meat products. Now, omega-3 alpha linolenic or ALA is found in things like legumes, leafy vegetables, flax, flaxseed, and canola oils. And your EPA and DHA, you'll find in things like fish oil and breast milk. Now, a lot of the um, plant-based omega-3s, and there are companies that advertise plant-based omega-3s, which I find quite amusing because they advertise these things as being really, really good for you. And they've got a nice big write-up about how good omega-3 is for you. And then in the fine print, they tell you that because it's a plant-based source that they're using, you will not find numerous of the um, omega-6 or omega-3s that you actually need. And they admit there that you're going to find that in um, fish and meat sources. So sometimes there is a little bit of, um, I can say, false advertising, but misdirection, essentially. So we're needing that EPA and DHA specifically in things like breast milk. And we get that from fish oil. And when moms are breastfeeding, the EPA and DHA are vital for baby's growth, baby's eyes, and baby's brain. So do we need to avoid or reduce? Things that we need to avoid are the trans fatty acids because they are bad for us. The omega-6 fatty acids, we can generally do with reducing. We're going to get it in our foods anyway. Things like margarine. In my opinion, we need to avoid it at all costs. Again, my opinion, because the argument is out there and it varies from day to day because of the different researches that it's coming forward, but butter, I feel, is better than margarine. Corn oil, cottonseed oil, grapeseed oil, peanut oil, safflower oil, sesame oil, soybean oil, sunflower oil, and partially hydrogenated oils. We need to avoid or reduce, or you know, just basically get rid of altogether. And any product that has a long shelf life. So when you buy a product, all products should have a manufacture date and they should have a best before date. Some of them will say it is an expiry date. Some of them will say a BBD, which is a best before date. If it's two years or more on food, don't take it because you're going to have problems because essentially they have stripped out all the good nutrients out of that product. And these are things like crackers, pastries, and chips. Now, how much omega-3 fats do we need? We need to aim for a ratio of the omega-6 to omega-3 of roughly about four to one. The usual SAD diet or the standard American diet will get you a ratio of 16 to one. Dr. Don Lawson once quoted in one of his talks that I heard that he recommended the ratio for omega-6 to omega-3 should be one to one, never mind the four to one. Because remember, omega-6 is very inflammatory by nature. Omega-3 is anti-inflammatory. And we need to have a maintenance level of around about two and a half grams per, um, I'm not quite sure exactly what their D stands for, but basically uh, it'll be two and a half grams per kilogram, I think, but I'm under correction on that one. And to improve the heart function is five grams. Um, we, to treat chronic pain, you're looking at seven and a half grams. So in other words, 
you need to increase your dosage of omega-3 according to certain levels. So to put it into perspective, one of our uh, salmon oil capsules is 500 milligrams. So if you look at a maintenance dose, what they're saying is you're needing about five of those per day. And to improve your heart condition, you're needing about 10 of them per day. And to, to treat chronic pain, you're needing more than that. And what you need to do, especially if there's massive inflammation, like a herniated disc in your spine, for instance, you start with two and you build up until that pain threshold is reduced. And then you start to cut back. According to um, Dr. Jim McAfee, this is called a titration effect. So you build it up. When the pain is stabilized, you then start to cut back until you feel the pain starting again. And that way you know what is the optimum dose for you. And to treat neurological disease, you need high doses of omega-3. Um, there's a, 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 this was taken from Sears in the anti-inflammation anti zone in a published newsletter from 2005. So you get different types of fish oil. So you get your fish, but you've got to be careful because there's, uh, they could have contamination with PCB, dioxin, and mercury. And also higher in alpha linoleic acid than fish oil. Then you get your crude fish oil, which has got high contamination. This is your... So almost factory caught fish and your farmed fish, you're going to find a very high contamination of heavy metals and other toxins. And then you get your health food grade. grade. There's still some contamination with PCBs and dioxins. And then you get your ultra refined EPA and DHA concentrates. And our product forms part of this. And they've removed PCBs and other toxins. And this can be used in high doses. And this is why our particular brand, which we know that every batch is tested for over 200 known contaminants. And I think it's somewhere in the region of about 230, but I'm under correction. We'll stick with over 200 known contaminants including the PCB, mercury, et cetera, with a detectable rate, rate of zero. If you know that you've got an ultra-refined, ultra-pure fish oil, you can use it, as they say, weapons grade. In other words, high doses, quite safely. Now, what is an anti-inflammatory diet? We often hear about this terminology being thrown around. We need to lose the fat. We need to eat small meals. We need to have some protein at every meal, but we also need to reduce meat and dairy. So we need to avoid charred and overcooked foods. Um, my wife likes a steak that's still almost making a noise when you take it off the, off the flame. So we don't always have a lot of issue with overcooked meat. Uh, I like something that's a little bit more cooked than that. But if your meat is charred, so in other words, you left it on the flames a little bit too much and it's got those the, the black stuff on there, be careful because that is carcinogenic in nature. And the other thing that we need in our, as an anti-inflammatory diet is cold water fish, namely the salmon, mackerel, sardines, herring, etc. The colder the water the fish is found in, the better the quality of the omega-3 coming out of it. We need to eat primarily fruits and veggies. Leafy green vegetables, nuts, flax seeds, or, um, or flax oil. So flax seeds or flax oil. And if you're not getting enough of that, you need to take your fish oil. I take 
two omega-3s on a daily basis. I have one with breakfast and I have one with lunch. If I don't have them, I find that I start to lose concentration. I lose a bit of energy and sometimes I have a few extra aches and pains in my joints. I don't like that. So I make sure I take it. And then we have to have an anti-inflammatory lifestyle. It's not enough just to watch your diet. It's also a good idea to watch your lifestyle. So we need to exercise. We need to quit smoking. Personally, I only smoke when I'm on fire. Uh, I would recommend the same for you. We need to focus on weight loss. So we've seen in previous talks how to work out whether you are overweight or not. Go back, read those, or listen to those, those presentations and work on your weight loss. You need to get to your ideal weight, not what the magazines, etc., say. If in doubt, please consult your physician or and or a, di a registered dietitian. And they will guide you on this. You need to manage your stress. And we need to manage our vagal nerve stimulation by our abdominal breath work. And either get a breathing coach. Yes, they are a thing. And if you look online, there are a lot of coaches online. So find a breathing coach or speak to a physiotherapist because they will also help you with breathing control. And it sounds really strange because if we're not breathing, then we're not going to live. But for all those who have undergone natural birth, you will know that they highly encourage breath work to help with pain control and obviously as a way to de-stress as well. We need to treat depression. Now, omega-3 is a very good antidepressant, as is things like vitamin D. We need social support. So if you are living alone in a secluded little area and you never get to see or meet or talk to other people, you need to get help because that is not a healthy lifestyle. And for short periods of time, if you need to de-stress, it's wonderful. But please don't do that as an extended time. Now, what does the American Heart Association recommend? Healthy individuals should take two servings of fish, namely your salmon, your sardines, your tuna, your mackerel, or your trout weekly, along with flaxseed, canola, and soybean oil. Remember all the studies that keep telling us that soya is bad for us? Well, this is a little story that tells you that soya is not bad for us. And in fact, it's how they process the soya that can be the difference between good and bad. Patients with CHD or chronic heart disease should consume higher doses um, of EPA and DHA, which may require fish oil supplementation. And I would say that here in South Africa, um, specifically, specifically in the area where I live, even though we are close to the sea, we don't eat a lot of fish. And because our seawater is comparatively warm, we've got to be very careful about all those toxins that we find in the ocean around here. Even when the guys go quite far out to sea, you've got to be careful about what's in there. Be aware that pretty much any commercially caught fish is probably going to have some sort of toxin in it or heavy metal in it. So it's they keep saying we need to have fish on a daily, on a weekly basis, but they also tell you to be careful about that fish because you could get poisoning, which is a little bit counterintuitive. And that's why, in my opinion, it's a good idea to take an ultra pure tested fish oil supplement because then you know that what you're getting is the good stuff. 
we need to utilize complex carbohydrates. Remember, simple carbohydrates are your sugars. Complex carbohydrates are your fruits and veggies, where one can get rid of all the other bits and pieces, um, and you've got your sugar as well as all the other bits that you do need. We need to have um, a diet that's higher in fiber and lower in the glycemic load to reduce the risk of CHD. And the AHA recommendations, or the, these are recommendations taken um, from this particular publication, Women's Health in Primary Care. And also there's another reference for you. So the indications from other studies, eating fish as little as once a week reduces the risk of sudden death in men. Eating fish twice a week reduces the CHD risk in women. So in other words, women need to eat more fish than men. And fish intake reduces your Alzheimer's risk. And this is just taken from this particular um, research beyond the, the Mediterranean diet. And how does the intake of omega-3 fatty acids help? It helps in the stabilization of arteriosclerotic plaques. We always hear about, oh, you mustn't eat fat or cholesterol because that causes heart disease. That is incorrect. It, cholesterol is not the problem. I was chatting to somebody this afternoon, in fact, and said, because she was saying that she's been on cholesterol medication since she was quite young. And this is obviously a genetic cholesterol issue. And as I said, cholesterol itself isn't the problem. We need the cholesterol because it's a protector. What we don't need is when that cholesterol sits on the artery walls, the vein walls, and it oxidizes, or for want of any better terminology, it rusts and forms these plaques. It's the plaque that causes the problem. Think of plaque on your teeth. If you're eating a lot of sugar or a bad diet, you have this buildup of plaque on your teeth. And you know how nasty that can be. How do you sort that out? Good dental hygiene. How do you sort out the arteriosclerotic plaques? Omega-3 fatty acids, because omega-3 is a very jealous fat. And if you think of Teflon, you put any hot plastic or something like that on Teflon in an oven, and it won't stick. If you put that hot plastic on, directly on metal, it will stick heavily, and you've got a huge, nasty mess to try and clean up afterwards. Whereas Teflon doesn't allow anything to stick to it. We've heard, all heard of the Teflon nonstick cookware. Now, this is essentially what omega-3 does, is it coats the walls of the arteries, and it pushes away the bad fats and the cholesterols. So it allow, keeps it in circulation to prevent that settling and your arteriosclerotic plaques. And it helps by redu or reduces inflammation by mediation prostaglandin synthesis pathway. Don't worry about the big fancy terms, but it causes a reduction in inflammation in your system. And it improves the ratio of omega-3 to omega-6 fatty acids by reducing the arachidonic acid and the pro-inflammatory and pro-platelet aggregatory cytokines. Big fancy words, but basically your omega-6, excess omega-6 leads to inflammation and leads to clotting. The omega-3 helps to prevent this. And it enhances the PGE1 and PGE3 and less inflammatory leukocytes uh, or leukotrienes. Again, don't worry about the technicalities. And the, um, I can't remember what the Q stands for, but it's to do with the American Heart Association. Most studies show very low cardiovascular mortality 
in populations with high fish consumption. And we know the story. In fact, GNLD, good old fashioned Neolife, were pioneers in developing omega 3 supplementation way back when. They were amongst the pioneer researchers that looked at the um, Inuit or the, in the Eskimo tribes who essentially live on blubber and pure fat and discovered that they don't have any heart attacks in the culture. When they were living on a traditional diet, these people could eat extremely high fat diets and have absolutely no problems. Heart disease was unknown in their population until Westerners got there and started to show them the benefits and the joys of sugar and other junk food. Suddenly they started developing heart attacks. So what they found was that because they eat huge amounts of fish and fatty acids from the cold um, Arctic oceans, they didn't, they didn't have any issues with heart attacks. And that is because of the omega-3. Um, the strongest, most consistent effect of omega-3 fatty acids was a reduction in triglycerides from 10 to 33%. Um, high glycemic load foods increase inflammation, they increase the risk of heart disease and diabetes. Examples include things like white bread and glucose, or white bread has got a lot of glucose in it. So your glucose index is quite high. Potatoes and white rice, pastries and white flour. Are we seeing a uh, common theme over here, white equals pure equals very bad. Sweets, carbonated soft drinks. Now your low glycemic load, you can see this comparison over here. And I'm not going to go through all of that because of time, but you can always freeze frame this afterwards on the recording and you see the comparison between good and bad. And the low GI reduces risks, um, or the lower GI reduces risk. And you find this in things like whole grains, fruits, veggies, legumes, or mixing high GI, GL foods with those with lower GI and GL foods. And these are some of the examples over there. Now, let me just come back to that. Do you see? Any comparison between what we generally recommend in pro vitality towards these foods? This is why it's done. Um, some superfoods that are useful for decreasing inflammation include things like beans, blueberries, broccoli, along with certain of the other products over there. Oats, oranges, and associated, and pumpkin. Again, can we see the carotenoids and flavonoids over here? Um, superfoods that, oops, missing my picture over here, that are there to decrease inflammation. Things like salmon along with some of the other fish. Soy are your two main ones. Spinach, tea, namely green or black, tomatoes, turkey, walnuts, and yogurt. So just one quick example before I bring this to an end. Food has changed over the years. For instance, I find this quite interesting. The ingredients in bread in 1970, which is still within my lifetime, was stone ground whole wheat flour, water, molasses or honey, yeast, salt, raisins, sunflower seeds, sprouted wheat kernels. 
the ingredients now are almost an entire book. Enriched bleached flour from numerous different sources. And that enrichment means that they've taken out the good stuff and replaced them with synthetics. River flavin, uh, folic acid, water, whole grain from numerous different sources, wheat gluten, skim milk, half fructose corn syrup, very bad, sugar, yeast, butter, um, calcium sulfate, salt, dough conditioners, a uh, whole lot of different funny big words over there, guar gum, calcium propanate, which is a preservative, distilled vinegar, yeast nutrients, cornstarch, vitamin D3, soy lecithin, and soy flour. Compare how long the bread lasted in 1970 to how long the bread lasts now. That is where our problem comes about. I'm going to end it right there because we only have about five minutes left. And I'd like to leave a little bit of time for any questions or comments that people might have before I stop recording. Any questions or comments?